speaking to Paula Radcliffe, who you may know as world record breaking athletes in the ultimate distance race, the marathon. But what you may not know about Paula is that she has a lot of experiences in languages, so learning languages and speaking languages, which we're going to talk about today. Um, we will talk about sport a bit too. We know that's a very popular topic in the classroom, so I will cover that as well. Paula, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your thoughts on language and the role they've played in your life so far with everyone watching this interview. Thank you. You studied um, modern languages at university. Did you have any experience with languages before that point or did your interest in languages come later on? Um, I think my interest in languages was kind of always there from, from a young age. Um, I think I was six months old when I first went uh, on a camping trip with my family um, onto, on the continent, basically. So we took the, the ferry then across to France. Um, then couldn't afford to do that for a few years and then started again when I was around about six. Um, and pretty much every summer holiday, from then onwards was uh, a camping holiday through France or Germany, Austria, um, but France was a firm favourite of mine. And I think from that very uh, early age, being immersed in a language in a different country uh, really instilled in me uh, a willingness to, to learn and a desire to, to learn the language so that I could understand what was going on around me and accomplish the things that I wanted to do, even if it was as simple as just being sent to the camp shop to change the, the camping gas cylinder. I can remember when I was about six being sent to do that and getting a little bit lost, not being able to express myself properly. Uh, and I think that really built up in me that desire to, to learn the language. And I think it's a beautiful language too. Um, and I, from the early days German was pretty much the first choice offered to me as a second language and that was the language that uh, I picked up then uh, and also enjoyed for different reasons spending a lot of time in Germany uh, and so I think yes it was that desire to to learn about I've always loved learning about different cultures traveling um, and that's much easier if you can travel uh, and make yourself understood and it's one of the things I find frustrating now if I travel to a country where I can't mm -hmm. understand what's going on around me because I guess I'm spoiled and that I'm used to being able to do that in a lot of the countries I travel to. Um, so modern European studies gave you the opportunity to carry on with both both French and German. Yes that was one of the key things that I looked for so my A-levels I had studied French, German and maths and I remember agonizing for a long time trying to, to pick which subject. And my dad said to me the best advice ever. He just said, look, just pick the subjects that you enjoy because mm -hmm. they're the ones you'll do best at. And then you can choose later when you've decided what your career might want to be. You can choose later um, when you go to university to, to specialize further. So that still didn't make it that easy because I also loved English, but I couldn't do that many A-levels. So I decided to, to go with French, German and maths. Um, and then when I was coming to the end of my A-levels, I had pretty much decided I wanted to, to go for a career in international business, uh, which meant then that I needed a, a, a university course that would combine my languages with either economics or business studies. Um, and I really wanted to keep both languages going. So that's in the end why I ended up choosing Loughborough University, um, because I could choose French, German, and economics all the way through, um, whereas the other some uh, universities that I'd looked at, for example, at Cambridge had a great course, but I had to choose to drop one of the languages after the first year. Uh, and I didn't really see myself wanting to do that. So that in the end made the decision for me uh, and I didn't regret it at all. Too hard a choice having to choose between two things you really enjoy. Did yeah. one of them come more naturally to you learning them or did you know, sort of, did you pick them both up the same? Um, I think it, different things come more naturally, particularly to a native English speaker. Uh, so, for example, the accent in German uh, and the early stages of German are much more simple for, for an Anglophile to, to, to grasp. Um, whereas 
the French, I think, getting the accent right, being able to understand people, particularly in certain regions where they speak very fast and with a regional dialect, that were, was maybe more difficult. Um, and I think I probably still find it hard not to try and speak too quickly in French. I probably speak too quickly in English as well, to be honest, but um, I tend to end up tying myself in knots and going down a path that I can't really finish <laughs> um, in French. But then I've also spent a lot of time living here and speaking the French language. So now French, without a doubt, comes more naturally to me than German, just because I don't practice it. I don't practice my German every day, uh, and I do with the French. You're in France at the moment. Um, are your are your your children obviously at school in France? Do they do they speak French when they're in school, or are they at school in English? Yes. Um, so I pretty much have been spending time in France um, since I graduated. I was to begin with just going for high altitude training trips in the Pyrenees, bought an apartment out there, and very quickly was spending a large period of the year there. And then in two thousand and five, we moved to Monaco. Um, so that meant that most of our year was kind of speaking French. My daughter was born in 2007 and my son in 2010. And they've both attended the Monegasque school system, which follows the French curriculum. The difference being that now my daughter at secondary school um, is in the Option Internationale, which means that she studies, I think it's eight or nine hours a week in English. Uh, and that's English language, English literature, and English history and geography. Um, now there's a lot of American history in there as well, um, but that's taught in English and then the rest is taught in French. So they are essentially bilingual. Yeah. Um, and it's quite interesting seeing the differences in the way that they learn the languages um, because they learn it very much by listening to it, by speaking it, uh, and they don't have to learn by memorizing all the rules, by memorizing all the groups that take et and which ones take avoir. Uh, they don't have to do that, they just naturally know that. Um, and genders, they just know. So that whereas I would have spent a lot of time writing out whether um, each, each noun was le or la, um, they actually just know that. And it fascinates me that I can just ask them and they instinctively know it. Uh, and I find that amazing. Um, and, and other things like the use of the subjunctive, the conditional, they actually find harder because they haven't, my son certainly hasn't got to that level yet. Um, so I'm still ahead of him on the grammar side, <laughs> but just on the sounding fluent uh, and vocabulary, some of the everyday vocabulary, he just has a better grasp on the, than I do. Um, but more of the specific vocabulary to what I do every day, I would still be, I guess, ahead of him at this point. Still beating him, he might overtake him, <laughs> but you still. We're a competitive family. We can't yeah. get over that. <laughs> do you do you speak English at home with with the children? Oh, sorry, French, not English. Um, yes. So when they were born, I tried to speak French with them. My husband's British. He's Northern Irish, um, so he spoke English to them from the beginning. I tried to speak French until at least until they started school, until they had, so they had that base because they wouldn't be then behind starting a French school. My daughter was great. She was at crash a lot of the time in French as well. Uh, and so she would absolutely speak um, back to me in French all the time, no problem. My son came along, refused point blank to answer me in French. And it, it's very hard to, to keep doing that when the child is just answering in English. And I really doubted how much French he'd actually taken on board. Um, but when he started school, it was all there. And he did all have it. And now, if he invites his friends over and they're speaking French, he will speak French to me without issues. It was just when he was younger, for some reason, his brain just identified me with being English and I had to speak English to him. He was clearly just being just being clever with you and then got to school and it was all it was it was all up here. <laughs> French is so lovely when spoken by little children, isn't it? I love I love hearing little yes. French. Yeah, and I think in a bilingual environment as well, you don't realise it, but certain words, uh, I think my daughter was about seven or eight before we realised that she didn't know the word for raspberry in English. 
Oh, because really? we were living in France all the time. We would go around to the shop uh, and we would just pick out the framboise. And so she knew what a framboise was and she knew what a fraise was because she loved them, yeah. but she didn't know the English words. And it was only when an English person asked her what she wanted and if she liked raspberries and she just looked at them blankly. Um, because you'd, certain things we just, I guess, just kept in the French language. Oh, bless. That's really funny. And then words like bêtise as well. So bêtise, there isn't really a translation for. Yeah. Um, so they would just come home from school and say, I'm, I'm really sorry, I did a bêtise. Um, because, yeah, they don't have a word for it. Ah, oh, the beauty of growing up in a bilingual household, you can just use, doesn't matter if there's not a translation, um, I guess. In your career, you've travelled a lot to um, compete, obviously. Has the international nature of athletics provided you opportunities to use other language or to pick up other languages? Definitely, absolutely. I mean, I was travelling and competing internationally from age 16 mm -hmm. so that already helped to, to build up my, my languages um, when I did my year abroad from university I actually wanted to go and try out the altitude training camp uh, which meant that I had to find my own job in Germany um, and I wasn't on a university placement with lots of other English students so I was completely thrown in the deep end uh, in Germany to earn enough money to go and stay at the altitude training center in France uh, and again, not many other English people around me there. So I was forced, if you like, to to push on with my languages. And I think it, it really benefited me. Um, and then just being able to, to chat to other athletes as well. Um, I think that helped my vocabulary. My first job, if you like, out of university, even though my real job was an athlete, I was at the same time translating for the IAAF magazine. So translating French and German articles into English. Um, and that was great. So being able to do that and fit it around my athletics, around my training, because it was essentially on a computer wherever I was, really, really helped. And for me too, it was a huge advantage competitively. If I was in a, a com competitive race situation in France or Germany, and I could understand what was going on around me. Uh, in terms of call room procedures, what the officials were saying, what the other athletes were saying. That for me was a huge advantage. Do you find, would you say English is sort of the universal language on the athletic circuit? Do most people speak English or is it more of an opportunity for, for you to speak other languages? Well, the, our international federation is based here. It's now World Athletics and it's based in Monaco. Um, and it has two official languages, French and English. So without a doubt, being able to speak both of those is a huge advantage because everybody speaks one of those. Yeah. Um, so I can, I can get by in any of the kind of athletics or even IOC, um, uh, uh, International Olympic Committee um, environment. Uh, as long as you speak French and English, you can get by there. Uh, similar, I guess, on the World Anti-Doping front as, as well. Um, so I think that's a huge advantage. A lot of the big sports federations are also based in Geneva or Lausanne. Uh, and again, if you speak English or, or French, it's, it's a huge advantage there. Do you have, did you have the opportunity when traveling for sports to get out and explore the local areas and the local cultures or was there not really time for, for that? Um, there wasn't always time, um, <laughs> but I tried to make as much time as possible. And I also was very lucky in that my training camp, I mean, my favorite training camp is in Fontrameau in the Pyrenees. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, of, of course, always have time to, to speak the language there and to be immersed in it. And um, I still have a, a training apartment there that I try and go back to with the kids for, for mm -hmm. holidays or for ski breaks if, if we can too. Oh, so yes, absolutely. Trying to explore a little bit in, in the local culture is something that I've always tried to do. So throughout your career, you obviously competed at top level and have been incredibly successful. I mean, you held a world record in the marathon, but you've also spoken about the enjoyment side of your sport and wanting to make sure that you always enjoy it alongside your success as well. Um, because people don't need to be top level and compete at a sport to 
enjoy it and see the physical and emotional benefits, do they? Absolutely not. Um, and I think there's so many times in my career where running has kind of saved me psychologically. Um, it's my, my thinking time, my processing time. I can remember when I was buried in A-level exams or finals at university, uh, just being able to just escape, even if it was just for half an hour, just to clear my head uh, and refresh my mind, um, really kept me going. And I would often think of much better things to write down in my dissertations mm -hmm. uh, or answers if I was stuck on something while I was running. Um, it, it just seems for me a time when I think more clearly. And of course you also, through that sport, just become maybe a little bit more organized, a little bit more committed to things. Um, and I think that really, really helps. Uh, and I guess a little bit more of a, an appreciation too of, of the world and what goes on in it and, and other people. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that really, really helps. And I think the, the health benefits and the psychological benefits are there no matter what level you take the sport to. In fact, they may be there a little bit more at a more of an enjoyment, hobby, recreational level than they are when they, the added pressures come of performing at the elite level. Um, so for me, I think the fact that the two went side to side by side was huge. And um, there's so many times where my languages have just been useful to me in the most bizarre moments. Um, for example, coming in to work on the New York City Marathon, or maybe it was to run in the New York City Marathon, and stuck in huge queues coming through through customs. And then at the front of the queue, the, the customs officer just stood up and shouted, does anybody speak French? And we were at the back of the queue and I went to the front of the queue, helped him translate for a family who couldn't um, get express what they were trying to express. And then that got me through quicker. <laughs> um, so that, that was really useful. And then when I was running in my final London Marathon, I actually ended up running with a French runner for a huge amount of that. So just to be able to converse with him and to, it's a very multicultural society and community around marathon running. And I think being able to, to connect with those people outside of just running alongside them, actually being able to chat as well is for me a, a huge advantage. And it's for me, one of the highlights of being able to speak languages is just being able to converse with interesting people. Um, and just to hear interesting stories, read interesting stories, and not to have that, I guess, um, blinkered view of only being able to understand in things that are written in English uh, and people that are speaking in English. Because there's, there's the social side to sport as well, isn't there? It's not just you and the activity, it's also a way to meet people perhaps even if you're in a new country joining a sports club would be an ideal way to meet yes. people definitely and I think you can meet a lot of people there yeah being able to talk to them would obviously be very very useful <laughs> we've kind of touched on this already but what kind of skills and attributes do you think sport instills um, in people that come in useful in life in general because it's not just about being physically good at the sport there's a big mental side to to being successful in sport as well like with anything in life if you don't really enjoy what you're doing then it's much harder to be successful at it um, and i think that goes for a career in business or a career in sport uh, you're just able to motivate yourself more through the downs um, to enable you to experience the ups and there are, there are downs in every walk of life and I think being able to stay focused, keep your eyes on the big goal um, and believe that you're going to get to there and in some way even enjoy that very hard work, then that will help you, you be more successful uh, and I think that definitely helps. I think having a sense of perspective again is very important. Um, that at the end of the day, it is just sport. It is just a job. I mean, it's one of the things I talk about in my motivational talks that one of the um, ideas, I guess, that I read about in a book by James Patterson, that everybody juggles five balls in life and they are family, friends, health, integrity, and career. And of those five balls, the career ball is different. The other four are very fragile, made of glass. You mustn't ever drop them and you have to look after them impeccably the career ball you can take a few risks with because if you drop that it's rubber and it'll bounce and it'll take you some time to get it back to the heights that you had it at 
but you can take those risks with it. Um, and I think having that perspective that the career is important, but it's not the be all and end all. If you're not there for your friends and family, if you're not being key, uh, true to your integrity, and if you're not looking after your health, then all of those things matter so much more. Um, so I think having that sense of perspective actually enables you to be more successful in your career because you can take a step back and say, you know what, I'm not happy from an integrity point of view with that side of it, or my health's not right right now, I have to take a step back. Um, and you can let it go for a little while and concentrate on what is important and then come back to the career later on. Uh, um, the dropping the ball analogy um, goes nicely with um, learning and speaking languages as well, doesn't it? Because I think a lot of people might worry about saying something wrong and not pronouncing yes. it incorrectly. Whereas, I mean, you can throw that rubber ball as many times as you want and people will just appreciate that you're trying and practice makes perfect if you like. So kind of the way absolutely. to get better at language is to do it wrong. Basically. Yes, no, I, I absolutely think it is. I think just to relax, to try, as you say, the native speakers then appreciate it that much more that you're trying to learn that your language and will help you out. And I think when you make those mistakes, they can be very funny, um, <laughs> embarrassing mistakes, but you actually remember them and it, it helps you to, to remember the, the correct way to express something. Um, and I guess it's the way that the kids learn when they're growing up. They're corrected by their parents and they learn by saying something wrong and, and it being pointed out to them. Uh, and it's the best way, I think, to learn a language. Yeah. Can you think off the top of your head of a funny example from either you or your children of a mistake that's made you laugh? Um, absolutely. I mean, my husband once told um, uh, the lady who owns our favourite restaurant that he was pregnant when he intended to say that he was full. Um, and she just laughed and explained to him what was going on. Uh, and then, then that was fine. Uh, and then the other thing is, that, of course, after a few glasses of wine, my husband's yeah. French gets noticeably better because the um, inhibitions aren't there. So he's not worried about saying the wrong thing. He just tries. And he actually finds that having lived here for, what, 15, 20 years, it, it is all there. It's just maybe not grammatically correct. But he can express himself very well if he's not worried about making mistakes. There we go. Wine is a wonderful thing. <laughs> You're in France. France is excellent for wine, isn't it? You're very keen on getting families um, running together, hence I believe you have a families on track event. Um, yes. How do you think schools and teachers could also play a part in getting young people engaging in sporting activities? Um, I think enormously. Um, that's, it's one of the, we're actually running a pilot scheme this week over with Berkshire Virtual School Games in Berkshire and if that works then hoping to, to roll it out across the UK and it's the 215 challenge because it started on February the 15th um, and kind of with a nod I guess to my marathon world record as well um, but what we were asking was the families to achieve two hours 15 minimum of exercise as a family unit over the half term week um, and to have fun doing it and that's the the I guess the rationale behind Families on Track is families spending that quality time together, exercising, enjoying it and making it a habit that they then do every week. So the first idea is a relay idea, which will hopefully come back once we're out of this pandemic. Yeah. Um, and that was where families together ran a relay race over laps of 250 metres, 500 metres and 1K and accomplished 10 kilometres no age limits, just having fun, not a race as such because so many different ages involved, but just inspiring the families to come together, spend some quality time together and to see the benefits firsthand for themselves of that physical activity as a family unit. Um, and so the 215 challenge, we're actually rolling out in Monaco also over the half term holidays. They've got two weeks here, so we're asking 15 minutes a day um, over the two week period. Uh, and it can be any sort of exercise and we're actually giving little spot prizes for the family that involves the widest age, age range in their family um, and that thinks of the most innovative ways to exercise together. So we had families going on a walk and collecting a rainbow 
of different colored things that they saw on the walk, which was a really great one. Um, we've had yoga sessions with grandma and grandkids taking part in the same one. Um, and it, it's just good to see people thinking a little bit and engaging in that. Um, because I guess if one thing from this pandemic has been a positive thing, it's been that families have spent more time together uh, and they've actually sat down for that meal together at the end of the day. So trying to capitalize on that and have them spend some time being physically active together as well. I think we have the time to do that. And hopefully then it will stick um, as we kind of, I guess, come out of it and return to normal. Yeah, I think getting families, focusing on families, not just the children is nice because obviously you're never really too old to, to take up a, a, a sport or activity. I know it's more common for children to take up something new, but there's no reason an adult can't think oh, I want to do this sport I'm gonna I'm gonna have a go. No absolutely and in our first families on track event that we had in Durham in 2019 it rained all day um, and yet so many families came up to me afterwards and said you know what my mum hasn't run for 20 years and she had such a great time she's now going to keep doing it or just people who hadn't run since they left school um, and then getting involved in it again with their children and actually seeing that it is one of those physical activities like getting on your bike with your kids it is something that you can do together and there's something about outdoors activity isn't there like you said it was hammering it down with rain but that doesn't really matter there's just something there's a well-being aspect about being out in the open as well isn't there Yes, there is. And a, I guess a team building one as well. And in this case, the team building is your family. We've talked a bit about how sport um, can play a part in developing your communication skills and the social side of it. As a professional athlete, you've obviously had to also communicate for the media and for the public. Um, presumably, there's a big difference between how you think about what you're saying when you've just been accosted at the end of a race for example um that would be very different to say preparing a speech for sports personality of the year how do you f form what you're going to say and how you put yourself across um that's a really good question i think <laughs> i was very lucky when i was actually still at university the management company that i was with gave me some media training which was partly um, questions just being thrown at you and you had to answer quickly, be it in an interview situation or just immediately post-race. I always found that post-race, I was generally okay. You're on kind of a little bit of an adrenaline high. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that helps your brain to just fire a little bit more quickly. Um, and also the questions that you're being asked generally relate to what's just happened. So you're not really being thrown something difficult. I think if I would anticipate that I might be asked about something completely different after the race. I would try and prepare at least my thoughts in my head beforehand so that they would be, I would have something planned in in some way for when, <clears throat> for when I came off the track. Um, I think speeches at sports personality mm -hmm. is very difficult because that one, you don't know whether you've won it or not. And I'm actually very superstitious. So I never planned anything to say when I won it because I didn't want to assume that I might win it <laughs> um so but again it's it's fairly easy it's kind of thanking everybody that, that's part of the big team um and, and so that one wasn't too badly with with commentating it's it's um a lot of stats um and so that's really making sure that you much as I guess with exams you learn uh, and you know what you're talking about um, and then also, again, it is a little bit learning as you go along and benefiting from media training helps there too, without a doubt. Um, I think the more difficult ones, I guess, more of the kind of pundit roles um, where you have to react to something that's happening and give your opinion straight away. Um, and that's something that I've, I've had discussions with, with other people in the same role as me. Um, who maybe say you have to kind of think a lot about your image and portraying your image. And I don't happen to agree there. I actually think you, you need to speak the truth uh, and what you feel strongly about. And it's the end of the day, it's not for me about 
my image or about people liking what I say. It's about me coming off air and being happy with what I said. Um, and it's slightly different. Um, and so I think so long as I keep that to the forefront in my mind, it can be difficult, but it helps me to at least come off air and be happy with myself. Um, and then I guess the other thing is when I move on to, to commentating or interviews in another language. Uh, and that is different because um, I have to make sure that I know the vocabulary that I'm going to need when I'm commentating. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different because as your second language, it's never, it never flows quite as naturally and as instinctively as, as it does for me in English. Um, but I guess I kind of flip that a little bit and look at it from the point of view that everybody knows it's not my first language. So maybe they'll give me a little bit of, a uh, little bit of leeway, um, in terms of, of making mistakes and maybe just taking a pause or getting a gender wrong somewhere in there. I think hopefully they would, they would let that go. It might, it might bring some amusing moments in as well. I mean, <laughs> like, like you said, it's always funny with the little um, slips of the tongue um, that happen. So which, um, which other languages do you, have you done commentating in? Would it be French? Um, yes, yeah, I've commentated in, in French and given talks in French and German, mm -hmm. so motivational talks. And then post-race interviews in, in French and, and German. In fact, that was, uh, I guess, one of the funny sides that I was informed in 2005, after it took me an hour and a half to clear the mix zone, um, that um, I was the longest person ever to, to go through the mix zone and do as many interviews as I did in, in the different languages. Wow, do you, um, do they, you form your thoughts in those languages now because obviously you're pretty fluent in them or do you, is there still an element of you translating what you're thinking from English into that language? I think that that for me is maybe the tipping point for what we would say is fluent in a language is when you start to think in it um, because I think when you're fluent you still make mistakes um, but you can understand what's going on around you and you can think in it. And I, I definitely find that when I'm, I've been speaking to a lot of people in French, when I'm running in France, I think in French. And if I'm planning something in German, I'll think in German. Or if I've <clears throat> had a conversation with someone in German, then I will, and I go out for a run afterwards and I will think in German on that run. Um, and it, it's that that I, I find interesting, that ability to, to change how you think. Um, I haven't yet reached the point where I dream in a language, not that I've been aware of in that, or I can remember anyway. So I think maybe that is the true tipping point for fluency. That, that's your next step when you, when you yeah. have dreams, <laughs> as well as going for the run, you'll have, you'll have made it. Going back to you talking about, um, you didn't want to plan a speech for Sports Personality of the Year because you didn't want to assume that you'd win. You did win in 2002, and I believe that made you the first woman to win the award in a decade. Um, what, did that, what did that mean to you? That award meant a, a huge amount to me, um, and it was on the back of my most successful year yet in athletics. Um, but the difference is that on the track uh, and in competition, it's essentially, well, it's not all within your control, but it's mostly within your control, whether you, you win or not. Um, but the, the voting in the sports personality is completely out of your control. Uh, and there's nothing that you can do about it. And it's entirely dependent on people picking up the phone and voting for you. So I think it meant a huge amount because I was extremely humbled by the fact that so many people in that day and age also took the time to fill in the coupon in the back of the Radio Times and mm -hmm. send it in and to, to put their votes in. And that for me is what makes it so special because it is other people taking that effort and, and making the time to, to vote for you um, that makes it a very, very special award. Because it's, it's, it's down to a public vote, isn't it? The Sports yes. Personality of the Year. So it's not just your achievement recognised by professionals in sport. It's you, your achievements and how you've come across to the public um, mm -hmm. showing that people people wanted you to win that award, which must be a very nice feeling. So although you're not a writer by profession, you've had a story to tell and um, told it. How did you go about writing a book 
and was that something quite out of your comfort zone? Um, yes, it was. So there's actually um, my first, my autobiography um, was ghost written. So I spent a lot of time sitting down with, with David Walsh and he ghost wrote it, then sent it over to me. And I kind of reworded it a lot to make it sound like me. So that was my first taste of it. Um, and then we added two chapters to it. And I think because I'd got a taste of it from going over and editing the, the first version, I just wrote the final two chapters myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I just found that much easier and also cathartic. It was dealing with a lot of the situations post Olympic Games in Athens. So I think I found it very cathartic to, to be able to put that down and express myself. And then my training books, I wrote myself. Um, and I think they were the ones that I just spent a lot of time planning uh, and working with the publishers, which areas I wanted to cover and then pulling it in. And I kind of came at it from the view, what would I be looking for if I was looking for a book like this? What do I really want to, to get across and try to get that across? Would you encourage people looking to improve their English to just have a go at writing? Absolutely. I mean, I think creative writing is a skill um, and I think it should be fostered in, in young children uh, and people should keep working on it all the way through because everybody has that creative gene somewhere in them. Um, and it might be for art, it might be for writing, it might be for sports or, or it might be for more than one thing. And I think unless you try them, you don't really know. Um, but yeah, I would absolutely encourage people to try and do that. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Sport, we know sport's a really popular topic in the classroom, so it's really nice to be able to speak to somebody from a sporting background. Um, so thank, thank you, you so and good luck to all of the students. I know it's a very difficult time to be a student right now, and in some ways you're missing out on um, a lot of your experience at university, um, but hopefully that will come in the next couple of years. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Thanks. It's a pleasure speaking to you.